Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event in connection with the Lundberg Institute. This is the 10th annual Lundberg Institute lecture at the Commonwealth Club and the first online one. Um, this is part of our online series at the Commonwealth Club, and we welcome all of you as our virtual audience and also those of you who listen later. We have a great lineup, uh, thanks to Dr. George Lundberg, of uh, doctors who have spoken for us before here, um, and we are going to cover how a large number of issues, but how the COVID crisis is going to affect the whole medical system. Uh, and I'd like to introduce now Dr. George Lundberg, the founder and uh, president of the Lundberg Institute. Uh, as I said, we've been doing this for 10 years together. And uh, George Lundberg has a great uh, and long medical career. Uh, he was uh, the executive editor of JAMA for many, many years and has done so many things in the field since and is a thought leader in the field and he's brought together others for this event. Thank you very much, George, for joining us again. And thank you, George, and thank you Commonwealth Club of California for providing the venue and the long collaboration with the Lundberg Institute, 10 years of the annual lecture. On behalf of the officers and the board of directors of the Lundberg Institute, I welcome you the audience to our first ever Zoom presentation from TLI, the Lundberg Institute. I'm an academic pathologist and a long professional career with a bunch of universities, but I've been a full-time medical editor uh, for about 40 years, <laughs> if you add them up. 17 years ago, we're running JAMA and all AMA journals, and now 17 years with Medscape from WebMD. Tonight, we are joined by four of the Lundberg Institute lecturers on Zoom. In 2012, Dr. Donald Berwick presented the second Lundberg Institute lecture on a bright future for healthcare. Is it possible? A longtime Harvard professor, Dr. Berwick, is best known for founding the Institute for Healthcare Improvement some 30 years ago or thereabouts where he is still President Emeritus and Senior Fellow. But perhaps he's actually best known for that a little less than two years that he ran Medicare and Medicaid for President Obama. In 2015, Dr. Elizabeth McGlynn, uh, here shown as Beth McGlynn, was one of a panel of three speakers representing the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. The others were Dr. Irma Mala, Irma Mala Sarkar of UCSF and Dr. Kathy McDonald of Stanford, who has recently moved to Hopkins. The topic was patient safety, getting the diagnosis right. Dr. McGlynn is now Vice President of Kaiser Permanente Research in Pasadena, Executive Director of the Center for Effectiveness 
Acting Dean for Research and Scholarship of the Kaiser Permanente Tyson School of Medicine. We've often had books related to this particular presentation, and here's the book from the Institute of Medicine called Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, a tremendously important book of about five or 600 pages, and that was the core of what she was representing. In 2016, Dr. Lena Wen, at that time Commissioner of Health for the City of Baltimore, spoke on public health and physician activism, lessons from Baltimore. Lena is now emergency physician and professor of health policy at George Washington University. She's a columnist for the Washington Post and an on-air uh, medical analyst for CNN. And Lena signed books back then. Uh, the book was When Doctors Don't Listen. I'm sure it's still available. I don't think she can sign it tonight because we're sort of long distance, but there you go. In 2019, Dr. Kenneth Kaiser, who also is on the board of directors of TLI, has been from the beginning, thank you, Ken, has had multiple careers. He's currently Chief Healthcare Transformation Officer and Senior EVP at Atlas Research in Washington, D.C. Before that, he was a professor at the University of California, Davis, for a long time. He's run the Department of Health of the state of California. He's run the California Cancer Registry. He's boarded in about six specialties. I, I don't understand this guy at all, never have, even though I've known him for a very long time. Uh, but he's best known because he ran the Veterans Administration Health Service, and he turned it from a problem area to a very good area. And then, of course, he left there. His lecture was normalizing health quality care, or correction, normalizing high quality health care, looking back and moving forward. The credo of the Lundberg Institute is one patient, one physician, one moment, one decision. Let it be a shared decision, informed by the best evidence and taking cost into consideration, no matter who pays the bill. Former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop helped me get the thing started, and he loved the idea of the business of shared decision making. At that time, that was almost, not quite revolutionary, but almost. Now I'm happy to say that it is a fairly common event. Perhaps not common enough, but it does happen. The TLI speakers and their topics, which comprise a veritable history of American medicine in this decade, 2010 to 2020, also include the first lecturer, Dr. Elliot Fisher, professor of medicine and community and family medicine at Dartmouth, who spoke on achieving a sustainable healthcare system. What might we do? He told everybody about accountable, accountable care organizations and how they might help. After Dr. Berwick, we were addressed by Peter V. Lee in 2013, executive director of Covered California. And he came to tell us about how he was going to get everybody in California and cover California if they weren't covered another way. And he's still doing that. Well, I'm really impressed by him. He was the son of one of my old time colleagues uh, at uh, USC, actually. <clears throat> uh, on, at, on 2014, Dr. Atul Gawande, professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, talked on the checklist manifesto and being mortal, medicine and what matters in the end, an inspirational and practical talk from his influential book, Being Mortal. Atul has gone on to do a whole lot of other things since that time, as you know, in, in addition to having his long-standing column in The New Yorker, which has been so influential. In 2017, Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal, an internist from Harvard, and then a writer for The New York Times for a long time, including out of Beijing, is now editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News, and she spoke on deconstructing America's high-priced health care. Many, frankly, appalling lessons of America's health care system grifters leeching money from all of us, as described in her book called An American Sickness. She, 
uh, she also helped all of us present try to figure out how to protect ourselves from our health care system's grifters. 2018, Dr. Gary Taubes, a Berkeley-based best-selling author, talked about the case against sugar. Gary made the case that world obesity and world diabetes, those other pandemics, come more from what, what we eat than how much we eat. Sugar. I had his books on Kindle. So I could show you my Kindle, but I don't think that would help much. So I'm not going to show you Gary's book. Tonight, our panel addresses American health care. What's left after COVID-19? I have a bunch of questions. I intend to ask, mix them up and ask, address each question to one person. But that doesn't mean that only that person will be the answerer. We might get through all 10 questions. We may not get past the second one. I don't really know. We'll try to find out what people think and try to make it entertaining as well as educational. And us have good fun in the process because that's really the best way you teach. So let's start with number one. And this is aimed at Dr. Donald Berwick, who used to run Medicare until the Senate said, I don't think we're going to confirm you. So he quit did a preemptive strike, and went off to do other great things. Here's your question. What number of inhabitants of the USA were uninsured on January 1, 2020? And what number do you expect to be uninsured on December 1, 2020, when we're about 11 months into this COVID epidemic? Don? I don't know exactly numbers, George, the number I carry around in my head is about 30 million people, 27 to 30 million people were uninsured at the beginning of this year. Uh, uh, I can't help mentioning that the, uh, the nadir of that number, the highest level of, of, of uh, insurance was in 2016. So it's steadily eroded since then. Um, right now we have two problems, at least with insurance. One is COVID and the loss of, uh, of uh, uh, employer-based coverage covered for a while for many people uh, by COBRA coverage, but there's a, there's a gap for people to fall into and they are falling into it. Uh, in addition, we've had a pretty systematic erosion of Medicaid uh, uh, through uh, policy and, and programs in the Trump administration. So it's, it's climbing. I would, I would not be surprised if we have a couple of million more people uninsured at the end of the year than we did at the beginning. Um, and of course the future after that depends a lot on politics. So you think the fall off will only be in a couple million range? I think so. Uh, there are there are some safety net options. We've also had a couple of states now ex expand Medicaid. Medicaid. Uh, two more states or three more states are in line to do that. We have 12 that haven't expanded, but that's that's helped a tiny bit. Um, so that that would that would be my guess. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Also, yeah, it anybody partly. disagree with that? What I would consider pretty optimistic number. Well, I, I would ask Don if he would prognosticate on, on the Supreme Court and uh, the Affordable Care Act and uh, what might happen and, and what uh, under kind of the worst case scenario, what that might mean. Uh, potential disaster. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, when, when, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, we had 50 million uninsured in the country. And by the way, we're not counting under insurance. That's a different, but very clo but a closely related topic. People whose policies don't actually meet their needs when they, when they finally have needs. And that's probably also in the order of 50 million people. Affordable Care Act made major gains. Uh, we added about 22 million people to coverage by expanding Medicaid and through the exchanges and subsidies. Um, so that, that cut the uh, number of uninsured. It also made insurance more effective because insurance companies came under requirements about um, life, not having lifetime limits on coverage, uh, uh, reducing out-of-pocket exposures and so on. So coverage improved quite a bit. Um, I, if the Supreme Court were to strike down the Affordable Care Act, I, I actually can't picture how that would be implemented. Uh, there are major structural changes in the way healthcare is now supplied, healthcare insurance is now supplied, and it would be extremely difficult to unwind it. So uh, 
I don't know, Ken, uh, I'd like to know what you and my colleagues think about that, but it's it's not pretty. The other thing to remember is the Affordable Care Act did a lot more than extend insurance. It had a lot of provisions to improve quality of care, a lot of provisions to increase transparency and accountability of insurers, major, major programs on getting people out of institutions into their own homes. It expanded coverage prevention in the both eventually in the commercial and the public side. Uh, all of that uh, would be at risk. Let me segue this to Dr. Lena Wen. Kind of an add-on question from that one. Is Medicare for all made more likely because of COVID or less likely because of COVID or neither? Hmm. It's an interesting question. And um, I'd be curious to hear what um, everybody else has to say about this too. Um, I will say, start starting off that I am not, if, I don't know if you turn to me for this reason, but I'm not actually a proponent of Medicare for all. Um, I'm a proponent of universal health care um, and thinking through various ways of getting there. I'm also, I think by temperament, I'm much more of an incrementalist and building on what we have with the success of the ACA. I mean, I went to medical school in the early 2000s when there wasn't the ACA. And actually, that's why I entered the emergency department and um, and came and started working in the ED as my specialty, because I didn't want to turn patients away who didn't have access to healthcare. And so I think building on what we have is the right approach. But that said, I think because COVID has just, it's been this tsunami. I think that's even an understatement that none of us could have ever anticipated. And so it's really turned our world upside down. And I do think that it's in times when our entire social structures have come undone, that it is a time for a revolution. And I think that those who are um, proponents of the revolution and starting over, if you will, um, I think there'll be a lot more traction. Now, because Again, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist and incrementalist. I look at the patients who are in need of care right now. And I do fear that when we turn everything upside down, when people need care the most, that the, those who are going to be hurt the most are those who are already the most vulnerable. Okay, but that's do, do, Dr. McGlynn, uh, what about it? What, what if the Supreme Court actually throws out all parts of the Affordable Care Act would that make Medicare for all a cinch or such because so much disaster would happen? Or would we just have to build it back incrementally to where we are or who, where would we go? Well, of course, we won't know the Supreme Court decision till next spring. And I suspect a lot of what the next steps are hinge on the election results and, um, and the, you know, in, in one scenario, um, if uh, Vice President Biden wins and the Democrats take the Senate, you have a very different pathway than if the election comes out another way. And you've got some runway um, while the Supreme Court is deliberating to uh, determine what the options are. Um, and I imagine that it will be, I'm kind of with Lena, I'm a, more of an incrementalist. I mean, I, I am hoping, I guess, and maybe it's just because it's too terrible to imagine the alternative that the system won't be completely blown up. Um, I think COVID has revealed how critical insurance is for people um, and I think has made it, uh, it's leveled the playing field in some ways in terms of people being touched by um, these challenges. So my hope is that we would have some time to begin um, stitching things back together um, and, um, you know, in anticipation. But I think a lot hinges, frankly, on the um, outcome of the election, uh, what, the, what the pathway is. Um, and I, I'd say one more thing. I don't, you know, Medicare for all is one of those terms that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Exactly. So I suspect exactly. a lot of it depends on kind of what you mean by that and what those components are. But um, I think it's a little hard for us to imagine going backwards from you know, horribly backwards from where we are. I just right. don't well, know that the public will tolerate that. Okay. Let, let me just, uh, before going on to the next topic, uh, say that nobody ever seems to talk about Medicaid for all. And yet Medicaid for all makes more sense than Medicare for all in a lot of ways as you build on it. And yet somehow that doesn't seem to be in our lexicon. Let's go on. George, can I just say one thing about Medicaid, which is, I mean, I, I do think one of the interesting things about the Affordable Care Act and the current situation we find ourselves in is that the stigma that had been attached to Medicaid has 
um, really decreased quite a bit and people are seeing it in a much more positive light. So I think you could be onto something. I'm just, you know, just wanted to um, say, I don't think we should walk away from that uh, as a concept. That's a, that's um, a really good point. It's stigma is different now. So George, let me, uh, I actually proposed that at a large meeting a, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, having run the, the largest Medicaid program in the country for many years. And I was uh, thoroughly trashed by uh, all the other people who were uh, on the dais as well as much of the audience. Um, but I still think it's not a bad idea. And, and you know, here in California, we added 14 million people uh, to the, the Medicaid rolls, which is more than all but three or four, the entire population of three or four other states. So uh, it can work and it can work well. well I just well, what, wanted to bring it up so that uh, the audience would get an idea that well, maybe they haven't thought of that, but maybe they should. Let's move ahead. Uh, back to Dr. Kaiser. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, we're into this thing, uh, Wuhan, December, and then January, and then everybody was talking about waves and waves and waves. And, but what, and then somebody said, well, we never got out of the first wave, and that every state has its own wave. But what is your best take on the concept of waves of COVID infection over time in our country, past, present, future? Well, a, a couple of things I would say off the bat is, is that I don't know that uh, waves has as much relevance here since we've never really gotten the, the epidemic under control in the U.S. So I'm not sure it has as much control or as much meaning in the U.S. as it might have in some other countries that did a, a you know, much better job of controlling it. I think the second thing I, I would say is that I would anticipate that we're gonna see a, a huge uh, uh, increase in cases over the next several weeks. Uh, I think a, a confluence of circumstances, what's happened at the colleges, what's happening at schools, uh, some of the Labor Day, some of the rallies, uh, you know, multiple different things are going to contribute to what I would anticipate. Uh, you know, I, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but what I anticipate is going to be a, a really large increase in the number of cases over the month of uh, October and, and probably uh, November. And I think we're beginning to see that uh, over the last week. Anybody react to that? I agree with Ken. Boston just uh, went into the red into the red column, eight, eight cases uh, per 100,000. And uh, I, I think I think Ken has exactly right. Whether it'll be in the next few weeks or the next month, I don't know, but I think we're headed for a surge. I would guess nobody disagrees with that. It's a, we're, we're, I, I mean, when we set this up, we were gonna be talking about after COVID, but I, I don't have the slightest idea when after COVID might happen. When it will be, yeah. Okay. On that nice note, let's talk about this one. Dr. McGlynn, what is the best way to balance the risks of SARS-CoV-2 infection versus the harms of isolation? So you've picked the only doctor on the panel to um, ask that question of. Um, I, I mean, I think you it's could a... be objective. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, a, you're, a, you're a, inhabited in Southern California where but somebody wants to open up, somebody doesn't want to open up, and right. you're, even your counties are different. Right. Well, I mean, I think that the, I mean, I think that we have not hit the right balance uh, yet. And I think a lot, of, I mean, I, I will say that my um, general sense is that we, um, if we had, um, and it's easy to kind of look in the rearview mirror, but if we had locked down more seriously, um, and stayed locked down early on, I think we would be having a very different conversation today. I do think this question about isolation and particular groups that are experiencing isolation, the elderly, um, I think adolescents are having a very hard time with the situation that we find ourselves in. And so I, you know, I do think that they're, they're that those um, factors should be taken into account. I don't, and you know, it would be helpful to have 
um, to be able to lean more on science as we make uh, these decisions and to find some creative ways, frankly, to um, to address the issues like isolation and loneliness. I mean, I think we, sh we should take quite seriously the mental health effects associated with um, the situation we find ourselves in. And I think everybody probably on this um, on this uh, uh, gathering tonight has probably had frustrations with the things that we can no longer do um, and and has um, and and find some of what we are um, engaged in very challenging. I, I I mean I'll just say when we went out on lockdown from work, I thought we'd be out for I don't know two or three weeks. I didn't give it a lot of thought, um, and so I think the uncertainty attached with um, not knowing when we're going to get out of it um, has made it really hard for people to uh, to cope. So um, yeah, I don't know that we found the right balance yet, um, and unfortunately, I think we. We lost some ground early on that has made it even more difficult to find that balance. Don, what do you think? We have a public health specialist here. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Lena, I, um, I have, a, I think, a couple of things. This is a very patient virus. Uh, uh, it, it, when we act impulsively, it just waits, and then it will come back and get us. And we, we, we've got to be uh, long-sighted and scientific about this. So uh, short hits are not going to be valuable if we, if we concede to the, to the, to worsening of the pandemic, we've got to take a long view. It's very hard in this country. It's the, everything feels so emergent uh, in the economic pressures and so on. But I'm, I, I really think we need a plan. We don't have a plan right now. And I think that would really be, it's important to plan ahead. Um, I, I, I have one positive thing to say in this very dour thing, which is uh, we're learning so much so fast. Uh, there's so much adaptive capacity being developed in this country, both at right, everything from the clinical end about how you care for these people that are affected to understandings of testing and, and treatment, eventually the, um, the, the uh, vaccination uh, regime, but even beyond that, how society can adjust. Uh, and I think we're, I think we're going to know a lot about how to mitigate some of these effects. Uh, we're going to gather a lot of knowledge. My biggest concern are, of course, for the marginalized populations, for isolated elders, for people with uh, at the lower end of the income spectrum. And we, we, we need a compassionate governmental response to help mitigate the effects on people who are most vulnerable. Kids, I'm a pediatrician and grandfather of seven, and watching families adapt and what all of these incredible adjustments for families where there's work and kids are now at home and they and our, our families can adjust. There are families that need a lot more help to adjust and we need to get to social policy about that. Right. Back in January, I, my, my wife would ask me, well, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? I say, wait a minute, we learning something every day. Every minute. And every day more. Lena, what do you say? What was your, you have a plan? <laughs> I have a plan. <laughs> well, I have more than no plan, which is um, which is <laughs> the <Current> part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. But, you know, I was actually thinking about this because somebody asked me earlier about what's been, um, why haven't we had a plan so far? And I actually thought about this and I looked back and I saw that there actually had been a lot of plans. Um, you remember back in April when it was announced about reopening, the White House's own coronavirus task force had a whole blueprint for reopening America. Now we didn't follow that blueprint at all, but there was actually a plan. Um, and I feel like everything so far that's been released, and this is not meant to be a political statement, this is just a descriptive statement, so much has been announcements and press releases. You know, it's 150 million tests that are distributed. It is whatever number of masks distributed. It's not a plan. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that piecemeal approach. And so I very much agree with Beth that had we thought this out in advance and really had a full, um, a proper shelter in place and then reopening slowly and carefully, that we would not be in the position that we're in now, which I uh, think as Ken said before, yeah. we, we're entering fall and winter with many more infections coming. Um, and so I think, you know, to your question, um, George, about um, about um, just what what how to get that balance right, I think that there are two major things. One is that we have made a mistake, I think, in somehow pity, and I know this is not what you're doing, but just the general narrative has been somehow pitting public health versus other things. 
that we're talking about what's the risk of you know keeping our kids out of school versus being in school or keeping job people out of jobs versus being in jobs and i think ultimately it should be that public health and the approaches that we're using is the roadmap back is yeah, the, the, the first back. editorial i wrote in medscape about this was well, might COVID blend public health and clinical medicine in America? I mean, that, that we really ought to do that, like merge the schools, for example. Okay, let's move on. We got a lot more questions here, but this one, next one was intended for Dr. Wen. It's a clinical question. Uh, a statement first. I consider the behavior of the American workforce during the pandemic to deserve great respect, admiration. How would you characterize the professionalism of the American workforce as displayed by this epidemic? I mean, I think it's been exceptional. I've seen health professionals from all places, paramedics and EMTs and other people who are essential workers to, I think Don um, was mentioning about how much we've learned in this process. I mean, we've evolved so much knowledge. I've seen my fellow doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists work with so little, running out of PPE, which we could never have imagined, but just seeing how much they've adapted. And so I think that, you know, when we talk about the case fatality rate and the amount of work that's been done to save lives, that's credited to the medical profession. It's not credited to the lack of a national strategy. Absolutely. Now let's let's move on from that to some of these other uh, also very important questions. Uh, Dr. McGlynn, you protested and not being a physician being asked <laughs> a clinical question, but you did fine. But you are in charge of a bunch of research programs. So how about this question? What was and will be the effect of the COVID pandemic on clinical research? So it's, I think it's a, been an amazing time of, you know, worldwide collaboration and, and speed. I mean, I don't think in my lifetime I've seen anything quite uh, like it. Um, and, um, and I think it's also highlighted in a way that we've known for a long time, but the importance of diversity in enrollment in trials. So as we are trying to learn really, really quickly, we can't learn just on a sub subset of the population. We really have to understand how, you know, prevention and treatment affects the broad spectrum of um, Americans, and we need to find ways to get past the mistrust that minority communities have in the research community so that we can understand what's going to work for um, everybody. So I'm hoping that some of the things that we've seen, um, the innovations, the the sort of speed, the 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 um, really um, collaboration at a level I've never seen, I'm hoping we can retain a lot of that because I think that bodes well for um, our, our future. I do, I'll say the one thing I worry about a little bit is that we're, we've become a little um, COVID centric. And so I do worry about learning in other areas being put a bit on hold and, um, and even some of the um, advances that we're making that we aren't thinking broadly enough. I mean, I think COVID has been a great um, diagnostic and a great teacher, um, but if we only take the lessons to be meaningful to this disease and to infectious disease, we're going to miss some big opportunities. So um, I think there's a, a, there's a lot that we'd like to hold, that I'd like to see us hold on to um, and a lot to be proud of and some cautions. Ken? So George, I, I'd like to kind of follow up on, on both what Beth and, and Lena uh, were saying that while I think professionals uh, across the board in, in healthcare, uh, their performance has truly been exceptional as, as was said. Um, and, and I think the, the system insofar as research has done well, but I think the COVID really has exposed a lot of vulnerabilities and weaknesses in uh, our healthcare system overall. Uh, and whether it, it uh, you look at how uh, specific populations have been addressed, whether uh, nursing homes or, or a number of other uh, populations, uh, it has exposed weaknesses there. When it looks at you know, PPE and, and some of the other supply chain issues, clearly some big vulnerabilities there. So professionals have done great. Research, I think, is doing great. And hopefully we will continue along that vein there. But this does also uh, shine the spotlight on and provide opportunities to improve the system overall. 
Certainly true. A, a reasonable segue from the research question has to do with the uh, the uh, creation of new scientific knowledge and the distribution of new scientific knowledge. And my question uh, to uh, Dr. Kaiser or Dr. Berwick, for starters, uh, what was and will be the effect of COVID pandemic on the distribution of scientific, medical, and public health information? Don, you want to start? Well, like Beth, I've been amazed at the acceleration of the speed of movement of, of uh, uh, scientific knowledge around. You know, there's a canonical paper. Uh, I, I actually, I know the paper. I don't know why it's been so widely quoted that it takes 17 years from bench to bedside for an average medical innovation. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Beth, that's a good research project for you to pick up again and see what it is. It's 17 minutes now. It's been really, really interesting <laughs> to see how fast things have moved around. Yeah, but uh, it's junk. I, a lot of it's junk. A lot of it's junk. How are you going to deal with that? Uh, some of it's junk, but for two, two things. First, um, on the positive side, we're seeing a relatively disciplined, I think, a relatively disciplined sense of curiosity in the, in the healthcare workforce, where they're using their brains to sort the junk from the non-junk. Uh, within, I think, a week of the arrival of the virus in, in Seattle, uh, I was sent a copy of about a three-page single-spaced uh, document that Seattle intensivists put together, having debriefed Wuhan intensivists with hints for clinical care of COVID and right. it was pretty darn good. I don't yeah. think anyone took it wholesale. I think it was subjected to a lot of critical thinking and I trust a lot of the workforce. As far as the junk goes, yes, there's a tremendous amount of stuff being purveyed now and that's why we need to make sure that we figure out how to prove the, uh, put, put the appropriate scientific regulation, if I can call that, the ability to regulate our knowledge growth with proper science. But I am excited by the pace. Journals, your journal, your old journal, JAMA, George is turning around papers, more papers faster than I've ever seen before. The National Academy of Medicine set up a standing committee on new infections. Usually it takes a year and a half to get that stuff going. In one month, they produced 11 pedigreed reports guiding care. So we're learning something about how fast. Yeah, who was that that said necessity is the mother of invention? That was you, I think, George. <laughs> but <laughs> we, 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 I, we shouldn't lose our brand on this one. We got, you're exactly right. We have to be able to sort wheat from chaff, but I'm more excited by the tempo than I am disturbed by the uh, threat of, of, of what you- I actually function. agree with that. Although uh, with, with medical publishing or medical information, you can have it fast, you can do it cheaply, or you can be correct. Pick two. And uh, that's a hard one. I mean, preprints. Now, uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Friends, the National Library of Medicine, and we're hosting a program, a two-hour program within a month on just this issue, uh, medical publish, just distribution of medical information, the issue of preprints, the issue of, of uh, journals that are predatory, that people get trapped into thinking, the issue of going on live television was something that, that you, don't, you don't have, I mean, what are, it's a really, really hard deal. Ken, you, you've done a lot of publishing and a lot of reading. What do you think? Uh, I would agree with, with Don. I, I think what he says is, is right on. Uh, but I, I would like, I think, raise a, a corollary issue. And I think what um, this has also exposed is how um, far we have to go in bringing the general population uh, along uh, with some basic uh, public health and other science concepts and uh, hopefully increasing the confidence in, in science among the general public. I, I think what we have seen uh, with COVID or what it has exposed is how um, thin is uh, often the, the level of knowledge about some of these basic concepts among the public and you know, the, the distance that we need to go to, to bring the overall population, uh, or at least a, a significant uh, portion of it up to speed in understanding some of these complex issues and also to, uh, you know, bring the level of confidence in, in science up. George, I, I have to leap in here about the uh, the need for leadership to honor the science because we, the, the attack on science in public arenas by leaders that's toxic. And that makes the, all this fast pace, of course, much more dangerous. I'm curious to know, Ken, brilliant leadership, the VA, did you ever experience this kind of politicization of the scientific stuff you were trying to, trying to get done? Or is this wholly new? 
I, I think it's it's new. I mean, there are certainly always been vestiges of it, and I can think back to my days, you know, running health in California, where I, I had a lot of problems on on selective issues, um, but I've never seen the degree of toxicity uh, and the wholesale dismissal of science that has occurred uh, with some of the the current leadership, and and how destructive uh, that is to everything. Uh, right, that, that, that has not happened in my lifetime, yeah. and it's so distressing. What did happen was on a single issue, the issue of guns, and uh, some voters in San Antonio, Texas, got on some Congress people who got the, the CDC unfunded for studies of violence, right. uh, but it was a single issue deal. On this one, it's just a broad scale attack on science. Well, we've made our statement on that. Let's move to something that might have a little more potential hope to it, like taking, turning a problem into an opportunity. Dr. Wynn, uh, the people who are likely to be prone to get really sick with COVID as opposed to not getting very sick, and we don't really know why, but we do know that if you have diabetes or if you have serious obesity, your chances are real that you're going to get a lot sicker and you may die at a much higher rate than if you don't have that. Might we use this opportunity to try to also uh, control COVID, do some good work on getting rid of obesity? And when obesity disappears, so does diabetes. What do you think? I'm going to give you not such an optimistic answer. Uh, maybe oh. somebody else has a more optimistic <laughs> answer here. I, I actually think that another thing that COVID has unmasked is unmasked so many of these underlying problems, right? It's unmasked disparities. It's, it's unmasked our, um, the problems of our employment tied to health insurance. It's tied to many, it's unmasked a lot of problems. Another issue it's unmasked is America's short attention span and our fixation on the pill for every pain, like the, the thing, the silver bullet because what actually we know, right? We know beyond a shadow of a doubt now that what we need to keep the virus in check is those hard things. It's the social distancing, the mask wearing, the reducing our risk in, in other ways um, for months, maybe for a year, I mean, for some period of time. And we're not doing that. Instead, I think there is a national strategy, if you will, that's pinned to the idea of getting a vaccine ASAP. Um, and just kind of letting things go in the meantime. We're not willing to put in the hard work in the meantime. Um, and I am therefore not sure George, that we're going to be able to put in the hard work to reduce the burden of chronic disease that's actually making COVID more severe. I hope that my best hope coming out of this is that we'll have more attention on public health. The fact that public health infrastructure was not strong to begin with, the fact that local public health was decimated, um, the fact that um, disparities are a long neglected issue and social determinants all factor into what makes people ill. But whether we'll turn our attention to actually addressing diabetes and, and heart disease and obesity, I'm not convinced. But, I'm, but I stand ready to be convinced if somebody else has an alternate view. Well, I was just looking for incentives. I mean, if you could go to the public and say, look, if you, get, if you shed 40 or 50 pounds, COVID is less likely to kill you. Maybe that's an incentive. Wear a mask and COVID is less likely to kill you, and we're not doing that. Well, no, but we're doing better than we were a month ago. And, uh, we're I think. not. We're, we're not. If not I get even better. Well, maybe not better. Okay, fair enough. No, we're <laughs> I, 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 I think the challenge is that um, the, you know, I, I don't think there's anything new about the obesity epidemic and the, the implications it has for a variety of health problems. Um, but we haven't really identified solutions that people are, um, you know, able and willing to embrace. And I, and it's not, a, there isn't a quick fix. I mean, as Lena was saying, there's not a, um, I mean, the quickest fix uh, may be bariatric surgery, and that's a rather um, significant undertaking. Um, and so I, you know, and I, I think it really starts with, um, it, it's, a, it's a lifelong thing. It's, it's easier if you can get a population not to become obese than it is to turn it around once it's happened. Um, but I don't think there's a, so I don't think there's a fast and quick answer to this. I think we know already what we need to know. 
Um, I do think that we need to pay attention to our sort of general health and well-being. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is the thing that will, um, that will turn it around. I wish it was. I mean, I, honestly, I wish it was. Yeah, I, I was on a program with uh, Tony Fauci about a week ago, and it was a small circulation program in the pathology community. Uh, but he was just shaking his head about, well, we can have a national policy on something, but then we have the implementation of this. It happens to happen on a state-by-state -state basis, and oh, oh, oh. And of course, more than that, it happened on a county-by-county -county basis. I have the pleasure of living in Santa Clara County, where we have a wonderful county health officer and a very educated, uh, informed population that wants to stay healthy. Even here, it's a problem, and we're still, my wife and I have been basically sheltering in place for six months because we don't want to get sick. We are able to get out in controlled ways, exercise every day and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, the fragmentation of the country and not having one plan for overall as a smaller country or a country with different forms of government might have been able to do. Everybody looks at New Zealand, obviously, and Taiwan and Singapore. Japan's a big country, but it's, it's a whole different culture also. Dr. Berwick, let's go, let's come back, go, go to this question. I showed Atul Gawande's book uh, earlier on. I, I'm wondering, has the U.S. approach to death and dying changed since Atul wrote his book, or has it changed since COVID or has it not changed at all? Or is it just happening because uh, you get locked in a nursing home and then you get sick and then nobody can ever see you again? How are we dealing with that? I wish I had better data, George, uh, but I have an impression. I'm happy to share it with my colleagues and you. Uh, I think the water level's changing here. I think there is a, uh, there's a sense of maturation and uh, more, uh, more more transparency about the conversation itself about death and dying in this country. Do you know when I went to Washington uh, barely 10 years ago, uh, it was absolutely third rail. Nobody would would talk a bit about advanced directives or uh, or advanced care planning. It, you literally couldn't mention it because you would the fear of getting slammed politically was so high. That's not true today. Uh, there are there are good discussions underway in the public and private sector about about uh, about that. So I'm I'm uh, I guess I'm a bit optimistic about the direction this is going. I think we have looking to for say, optimism here. Uh, yeah, to talk yeah. about there's, death there's, and dying and put optimism in there with death and dying is a pretty interesting use of terms. Anybody else have an opinion that's any different? Can I just say one more thing about this? There, there's a there's a thing about this that, there, that isn't exactly what you're asking, but I'm very intrigued in the COVID era. That has to do with overuse, not just in, in end of life care, but we have massive overuse of ineffective care in this country because it's been reinforced by the fee-for-service system. Now we've had this period in COVID when you wouldn't go to the doctor, pe people aren't going to the hospital. And there's a very interesting thing playing out in the research community, which I hope develops fast about what did we just learn? You know, there's certain, like if you probably have an ST elevated myocardial infarction, probably should go to the hospital. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've, we've, we've learned through decades you have to do that it turns out you don't have to do. And I hope there's a vigorous research enterprise. That's there. a little bit like Beth, uh, Beth is down there in Pasadena. When I was at USC as a pathologist, uh, we had a, a doctor strike in California over the malpractice issue. And during the doctor strike, the data showed the death rate went down. Yep significantly down so <laughs> i don't know uh, okay meanwhile back to dr mcglynn and all of you can deal with this one it's been one of my favorites and it's not it's not simple none of these things are simple but how has education of the general public and for that matter physicians about the diagnosis of the virus in respect to the concept of accuracy specificity sensitivity, predictive values, false positives, false negatives, uh, pre-analytic factors, post-analytic factors, interpretation of this, predictive value depending upon prevalence of that particular disease in that community. Doctors have trouble with all of those concepts now. 
I first published about this in 1975 when Ray Gambino came out with a book called Beyond Normality, which introduced the doctors of the world to the concept of sensitivity and specificity. They still don't understand it, although they're doing better, I think. What do you think, Dr. McGlynn? You, you were on that whole group about diagnosis at the National Academy of Medicine. Are we making any progress? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I do think on the one hand, we've had this, what I call a national teach-in uh, of epidemiology 101. So, um, and I, you know, never have epidemiologists been so much in demand by the major news networks. <laughs> it's like their, their moment in the sun. Um, so we, you know, and I do think what it's meant is that the public has become more familiar with some of those terms. But the, the bottom line is, I'd say uh, there are a couple of things. One is the concepts are still quite complex. Um, and I think very hard, um, I, you know, we're I, involved with the, the inaugural class of the Kaiser Permanente uh, Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. And that's one of the things that we're, you know, teaching. And it's, it's really interesting to try to get people to grasp that. So it's complex. The other thing is that those concepts apply at a population level. And honestly, for most um, people, it's really what does it mean to me? And I don't think we're always really good at translating from um, what we understand at a population level to what it means to the patient um, in front of me. And and so I do think that there's greater awareness. I'm not sure that um, the general public has a much greater understanding of you know, the diagnostic process, particularly the uncertainty attached to the diagnostic process and the way in which um, the sort of operating characteristics of the mechanisms by which we arrive at a diagnosis um, affect the likelihood that we've you know, hit it or not. And then, as we said before, I think all of that's been complicated by um, you know, really chaotic communications about all of this. Um, so I think that there's as much information, um, there's as much misinformation as there is information out there. So I'm not really confident that we've made a huge amount of progress, except maybe in familiarity with some terminology. I mean, to be fair, I'm a doctor. Uh, I have a patient. I get a nose swab. We send it off for a PCR, theoretically the most specific of the efforts to find whether the virus is there, it comes back positive. What am I supposed to do? It's positive. But if the prevalence in the community is low, the chance of that being a false positive are about 90%. I mean, yeah, really. so But what we know today is that we should just assume, test or not, that everybody has it. I mean, the only way that we sort of, I, this is really Lena's territory, but I mean, the way we stop the virus is that we, um, I mean, that information can be helpful. Um, you can, you, if we, if we had a, you know, a fully functioning public health system, we would be able to take steps to contain um, those, um, uh, you know, sort of known cases where we have some reason to believe. Um, and so, I mean, the, and, and I agree with you that the prevalence really affects how much we, confidence we have, but in many ways, I'm not sure that changes what we should be doing. Um, to, and if we just acted on those, you know, maybe it means some people get isolated that didn't need to be isolated, but honestly, if it stops okay. the spread, it's worth it. <laughs> Put your mask on. <laughs> Put your mask on. Yeah. But Lena should really answer that. Lena? Yeah, if I can, I um, maybe less on the specifics um, of of um, of the epidemiological terms or what or or whatnot, but um, more on just the understanding of risk. I think that there are that people, especially around reopening and what people can do, are misunderstanding a couple of key concepts that I think are really leading to more spread. Um, I've written about this and I have, um, I should have a column coming out in the post tomorrow, in fact, about this as well. One of the problems is people thinking, well, if something is open, that means that I can, I can do it all. That if I, if my school is open for my kids, then I can also resume birthday parties and play dates and dinner parties and everything else. And of course, that's not it at all, right? That it's, there's the cumulative risk that we should be thinking about, not the if, we, if you can do one thing, go ahead and do everything. And I think that's, it's very hard to convey that concept to people, especially when it looks like out their window, like everything's back to normal, everybody's going about doing the normal things. So I think that's one concept that, yeah, that but that's a, a miss. But the second thing that's also a growing issue is that, um, and again, understandable why people think this is the case, but they're so much more relaxed around their friends and family than they are around their strangers. 
it's this magical thinking that some have called it that of, well, people I love can't possibly have it. They look fine. But the same people who <laughs> will, will never consider, you know, they're getting their groceries delivered. I mean, I have a patient who gets her groceries delivered. She can't fathom going on a bus for 15 minutes, but she invites her friends and her family over for indoor to have indoor dinners together. And it's because this thinking that, well, they can't possibly have it. But now we know that most of the recent spread is not so much in congregate settings anymore. It's in these individual settings like that. And so I actually think it's much more useful perhaps than conveying you know, negative predict predictive value or whatever to patients. It's these concepts that really influence how people live their lives. Yeah, I assume everybody I come in contact with, even at six or eight or 20 feet, is infected and that I put make sure my mask is on and distance and hold my breath as they go by or anyway and, and mostly go outside. We have I would guess from my clock maybe five minutes before George Hammond will take over and field questions from elsewhere. Five minutes isn't very long but quickly stated we'll start with Dr. Kaiser on this one. How are the Democratic and Republican platforms about health similar or different? about because of COVID? Five well, seconds, 30 seconds? Yeah, well, since the uh, Republicans don't have a platform, that's that's hard to uh, answer. Uh, it's easy to I, answer, I, they don't have one, okay? <laughs> I mean, there is nothing to comment on there. Uh, I think as, as far as, uh, you know, the, the Democrats, there's a, a much more clearly defined plan and, and approach uh, that, uh, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to operationalize. Don? Well, I served on the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force and I can talk about this issue there. It was very interesting because the there really are two, uh, two healthcare positions during the COVID pandemic. And as long as that lasts uh, position in the, Dem in the Democratic, at least the recommendations of the Democratic Party of a, I would call a very generous view of coverage, uh, completeness, uh, every 100% coverage of costs of COVID care. It's sort of an example of the country really reaching out to people who, to everyone, including people who are vulnerable during the emergency. Then there's a second component, which is a more um, moderate uh, view of what the steady state could look like. Uh, as Lena said earlier, moving, trying to move toward universal coverage, not quite getting there, but they're using the public option, encouraging states to expand Medicaid and so, so forth. So you actually get two views of public policy within, within the democratic uh, uh, platform, at least as the Unity Task Force recommended it. On the Republican side, I, I, like Ken said, I, I don't know. I haven't haven't really seen anything nope. I would call a plan or a policy play out, except to devolve a lot of the responsibility in COVID to states. Doctor Wen, yeah, any comment I, I, on what the what the platforms might include or how they might act, depending on how the, the election goes. I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I would okay. just say um, that there is a unique challenge for um, if um, Vice President Biden ends up becoming the president, which is that he's facing an incredibly polarized country. So as great of a plan as could be written on paper, how are you literally going to get people to abide by, for example, mask mandates? Um, it's very different than, I mean, his plan, and I've, I've written about this, that his plan would be great if it were implemented in January of 2020. But if it were implemented in January of 2021, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Dr. McGlynn? Yeah, I'm not sure I have anything to add. I, I do feel like healthcare is something mm -hmm. that um, Americans, the public, the general public agrees about more than they disagree about. And it would be lovely if we could find a way to use that, um, uh, that uh, level of agreement to find a path forward. Um, and and uh, be able to really make some progress because it's just so critically important. Um, so my hope would be that the that we you know that we find a, a path to solution um, uh, and that we use this lesson that we've learned to motivate us to find those those uh, solutions. I like that as a George, closing statement. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Oh, I was just going to say the the. Last little point I would make, and, and what we found in, in lots of other issues uh, like this, is that we need to reframe and recast the whole argument. Uh, we, we need to think about it in a, a different way than 
the way it's been presented uh, and argued over the, the past uh, many months and, and whether that's casting it in terms of patriotism or, you know, there's a number of other ways that it could be done. But I think the, um, the issue has to be reframed if we're going to have a, a new start. There's a great electron. I live in the Silicon Valley and we make a lot of machines out here. But there's a great feature that a lot of them have. It's called the reset button. If you can find the reset button, man, that's great. But I don't know how you do that with human systems. Meanwhile, back to Mr. Hammond. Have any of the people out there seen fit to ask any questions? Absolutely. And there's a lot of questions about, uh, and on both sides of the issue, about the potential vaccine. As you know, the Internet is filled with all kinds of uh, ideas about this. And uh, is there anything, some people are saying, is there anything you can say that will calm down that group? And the other group is saying, is there, is there any way to trust it? And I, I think that plays into what you've been discussing. Uh, one of the big issues is how do you get the whole population or at least a large amount of the population to, to cooperate with any medical system that's, that's on a vast scale? So, so uh, if you could say something about the potential vaccines and, and uh, explain why they might not have uh, um, microchips in them, that would be useful. Don, so, you're the pediatrician. Maybe you'd like to de deal with that. I was hoping you wouldn't pick me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to. Anybody but, else? Well, nobody well, seems to jump. It's the, this is the learning system we're talking about. First, first in the scientific end, we're, we're seeing an immense engine. At where 100 and, I think it's 160 vaccines was the last number I read, currently under development. Uh, and there's going to be success out of that. I think it's going to take longer than people hope, uh, certainly than I hope, but I think we will see the emergence of something that's going to be as effective as, well, not as effective as we want, but at least as good as the flu vaccine. Uh, however, a lot of this depends on the leadership issues we talked about before. We're going to have to build public trust around the integrity of this component of the public health care system, and that's been severely eroded. And of course, people are when you hear different leaders giving different signals and, and, and yelling at each other and, and some obviously irresponsible stuff going on, of course the public will not be, trust, it, trust uh, what's happening. So we have, I, th I think there's a sequence here, which is restore public trust in the scientific integrity of the vaccine endeavor. The other one has to do with commitment to equity because uh, this is an international issue. The United States withdrew from the international sharing regime for vaccines, a very, very unwise move because we're not going to benefit as fast as we could from developments in other countries. And we're going to have to return to some sense of morality in terms of ethics uh, as to who gets access, access to the vaccine when. I, I just want to weigh in on, on something that Don said, and, and uh, some of the work I'm doing is uh, somewhat involved in, in the vaccine issue. But you know, and, and a conversation I've had probably at least a half a dozen times in the, the last week has to do with the effectiveness of the vaccine and that people uh, seem to be stunned uh, to learn that the vaccine, whichever one may become the, the candidate or the candidates that are used, may not be 100% effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and understanding it, you know, Don was saying as effective as a flu vaccine, which, you know, is, is not 100% effective by, by any means. And, and so building some understanding both in, uh, the trust in the system that it'll be safe, but also understanding or having realistic views about how effective a vaccine uh, can be and what some of the limitations of uh, vaccination will be, even when one is available and the need to continue with some of the other practices. Yeah, I was going to say that it's just going to be one tool in our toolbox and it's unlikely to be, I think the thing that worries me is people are pinning um, all of their hopes on vaccine and then everything can uh, go back to the way it was before. And I think that's highly unlikely anytime in the, you know, near future. So it, it, I, I do think I'm um, talking about it as adding, you know, a, an additional tool um, and also paying a lot of attention to communications with, um, and radical transparency around the science. I mean, I just think that that, you know, and a, really a commitment to keep politics out of the approval process. I think we have to do all of that. Um, and it's still, I think we have a long road ahead. I was very yeah. pleased to see here Bob Redfield, who's been under attack from every way, a lot of times for good reason. When Bob, we go back to the <laughs> 80s and HIV days and I've always respected the guy, but I was pleased when he came out about a week ago and said, 
a vaccine effectiveness might be about as effective as wearing a mask, although maybe not as effective as wearing a mask. So maybe if you do them both, you'll be in pretty good shape, but don't give up the mask. Lena, one last comment here for us. You know, I was just thinking about this issue of vaccine hesitancy and um, um, there's already a group, right, a baseline that is skeptical of vaccines. Um, they are skeptical of science. But mm. now you've added on top of that, a group of people who are really skeptical of this vaccine mm. because they believe in science, but they are afraid of political interference. I mean, you have a Pew poll that showed back in, I think it was May, that 72% of people would take the vaccine. Now it's down to 51%. Um, more than 60% are concerned about political interference. And so I totally agree with everything that's been said. I love this idea, Beth, of radical transparency. Um, and I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's not so much going to be the president or whatever elected official saying, take this vaccine, it's now approved. It's really going to be up to individual physicians making the recommendations to our patients. And we're not gonna make those recommendations unless we trust the vaccine. And ultimately for our vaccine to be effective, it doesn't just have to be effective and safe. It also has to be trusted. So- That's a great I point. And I, I think, yeah. oh, thank you very much for joining us, Lena. I'm sorry um, that I have to go, I have to put the baby to bed. <laughs> thank you, congratulations, George. Bye bye, Lena. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, the uh, another question that came in that's uh, related is uh, the diversity of all of the vaccines. I think, Don, you said there are 160 that are going on. Um, what does that say about how medical knowledge has spread around the world, how all these different places have been uh, developed and that we might, the person with the best uh, vaccine might be some uh, medical facility in Nigeria or something like that. I think maybe it's going to be one of the first demonstrations of, of uh, the spread of scientific knowledge around the world and everybody's institutions. That's, that's sort of the, the, the framework of it. Does anybody want to talk about, about that shift? Because that shift is a fairly recent shift that there's so much research being done in other places. A lot of people think, oh, all the, all the knowledge is being figured out in America and Europe. Um, and that's not true anymore. And I'd like to, to have you all talk about that just a little bit. Now, I mean, the, the U.S. no longer has a monopoly on the biomedical research enterprise. Uh, there is very stiff competition from uh, both West and East. And I think we have to understand uh, that the world is very changed in that regard. And so at, at the moment, we don't know where uh, the major breakthroughs are going to uh, come from. I that see might this. Be a, it, yeah. I was going to say that, that might be, uh, you know, competition from a financial point of view, but from a from the consumer point of view, from the uh, population's point of view, that competition should be a good thing for the medical industry, right, in the world. Competition, but cooperation also. Yeah. I, I see the this question you're asking, George, is it's sort of a breed of problem that we the, the planet has now inherited. It's the same as global warming and climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are we are. We are, like it or not, one planet with a very, fuzz, very uh, uh, fuzzy borders and uh, things move around, uh, bad things and good things. Uh, but in order to manage the good things, the knowledge base you're talking about, we need, uh, we need international institutions that we invest in, that we trust, that, that, are, that, are, that curate uh, this kind of knowledge and help, help us all sort the best from the worst. Uh, right now, those international institutions are, they're, they're really trying hard. I, I personally believe WHO has done a very fine job despite the criticism, but we, uh, we need to build uh, a kind of international uh, curation of knowledge and support for exchange of knowledge. Not, and you're right, George, not just so that the North can help the South mm -hmm. uh, in this world or the rich can help the poor, but vice versa, because the countries that are emerging economies and lower income countries are producing tremendous amount of knowledge that we can use in the United States but we have mm -hmm. to think differently about the global regime. Yeah. Beth? No, I mean, I think the, the competition is, um, or the, the, you know, the, the sort of heavy engagement is exciting. And I think we don't know all of what will come out of it. And I, I do think that it's unfortunate that the United States has sort of taken itself out of being part of the global community. Honestly, mm -hmm. the way, the path back to normal um, is, is for the, the world to have access to whatever is going to 
is going to turn out to work. And so I think, you know, it is in all of our interests to find a way back to that kind of international collaboration. Um, and not, you know, uh, many of those things, many of those vaccines won't succeed, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's tremendous that we have this much running at the same time, because I think as, as somebody said earlier, um, it increases the odds that we're going to find something that, that, you know, that works or works well enough to, to move us, um, you know, to uh, it'll allow us to have some progress. George? No comment. Go ahead. Right. Next so, question. Uh, it, it, and, uh, it reminds me a little bit of other scientific uh, endeavors that took place, you know, between the communists and the, and, and you know, the scientists are, are an international community anyway. And uh, so I think that that's something, even though people don't trust uh, science, that lots of scientists that have worked for even the last hundred years across lots of political borders uh, to the, to the benefit of all of us. Um, yes. Some, some things, you know, didn't work, but, but we certainly have gotten a great advantage out of that. And I thought, Maybe that's one thing that, that COVID-19 will, will teach us. And you, you mentioned it, Don. Uh, it might be a nice dry run for working on climate change together, right? That, that, that we, we, we are able to work together on something that's an immediate ri uh, risk to all of us uh, when we can see a long-term risk. So George, any, yep. any last comments from the Lundberg Institute? Well, thanks to everybody uh, for participating. Thanks for being a speaker earlier. Uh, thanks to all of our uh, lecturers who are out there watching, even though they weren't able to be with us. And thanks to our audience. Thanks to George, our, our gracious host, and to the Commonwealth Club. And be healthy. And safe. Thank you. Thanks, George. <laughs> and so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club, another, the 10th, Lumberg Institute lecture. Um, and it was 118 years of enlightened discussion, only 10 with the TLI, but 118 for the Commonwealth Club. Thank you all very much for joining us. Good night.